Welcome to Books and Things. And uh, I had to take a couple weeks off, so I hope you enjoyed the reruns. But tonight's not a rerun. Tonight is real. And I have a gentleman here that I'm not sure if it's safe or not. <laughs> but, but he wore a wire to uh, bring down some corrupt politicians in Rhode Island, which is a surprise. You wouldn't think there'd be any. None at all. <laughs> Anyway, this is uh, Paul Caranti. Caranti, great. Glad to have you, Paul. My pleasure. And we're going to discuss this. How did you get started in doing this? You wanted to be in politics forever. Yeah. But yeah, uh, my my from college on, pretty much my entire adult life. I uh, looked for an opportunity to become involved in politics. I'm a third generation resident of the same village in North Providence, uh, Senadale. Um, so that was all I really knew, life in Senadale. And mm -hmm. I, I wanted to make it better. And I thought I knew how to do that. So I at least wanted to offer my ideas and, and uh, hopefully get elected and make a difference. But what I found once I got elected was that um, it wasn't so easy to make a difference. Uh, everyone seemed to have an agenda, and the agenda didn't always align itself with what was in the best interest of the town or the town's people, and that frustrated me. And for many years, uh, I guess because I wouldn't go along with the show that they were putting on, um, my uh, proposals, my motions would not sometimes not get a second. Sometimes when they were seconded, they, they, they weren't uh, voted on favorably. And I had to resort to you know, the typical politics of getting things done. I had to go out into the community and I had to meet with people and groups and, and you know, talk about what I wanted to do and why it was a good thing. And instead of just convincing seven people on the council or six other people on the council, I had to convince hundreds of people in the community that this was the right thing to do. And I did that each and every time. But it took me months and in some cases years when it should have, you know, common sense proposals that should have uh, been passed within a week. Um, and that frustration finally grew to the point where I knew something was going on, I knew something was awry, but I just couldn't prove it. And then uh, my wife said to me one night, I used to go home after each council meeting and rant to my wife, you know, and talk about how, how terrible the meeting was and what happened. And, and finally one day she said, you know, why don't you just hang out with these guys and you know, let them know that you're just a regular guy and you're trying to do the right thing. And you know, right now they see you as a political bad guy. And you know, let them know that you're a regular guy. So I had tried that before, but it didn't really work. And uh, finally I said to her, you know what, I, I'll do that. And there was a conference coming up in um, Orlando, Florida. And it was a, a National League of Cities conference. And we had gone on them before, and I enjoyed going to the sessions and learning what people in other parts of the country are doing to solve problems that we mm -hmm. all sh you know, have in common. Um, and the other guys like to you know, drink and, and party and sightsee, and, which is fine too. I enjoyed that, but I also wanted to go to the sessions. So I didn't really hang out with the other guys at these conferences. I went on my own. And she said, hang out with them this time. So I said, you know, I'll, I'll do that, but only if you come with me, because you have to witness what's going on to believe it. Huh. So she said, okay, I'll come. And uh, I paid for her, <laughs> and we paid for her a trip. Uh, it wasn't on the town's dime, yeah. but we went. And it gave us the opportunity to overhear uh, a conversation um, when we were having drinks. I, in fact, I wasn't even there, but I, I heard about it later secondhand. Um, having drinks at the Blue Heron restaurant in Orlando. And um, one of the councilmen stood up and said, uh, he put his arm around the other two councilmen that were on either side of him, and said, do um, you think that we're going to vote on that stop and shop proposal in, in December's meeting? I was really counting on the money for Christmas. <laughs> well, that was the proof I needed, but now what do I do with it? Yeah. So, you know, obviously one option is to go to the FBI, but I didn't want to do that. You know, I'm an, I'm an Italian. Um, and in the Italian culture, I come from a, a community of mostly Italians, and in that culture, going to authorities to, you know, rat out people like that is not considered a virtuous thing by any stretch. It's frowned upon. So I knew that doing that kind of thing would make me an outcast, 
and um, I didn't feel good about doing that. So I tried working with them. I tried talking to them. I tried letting them know that, um, you know, I'm, I know what's happening. Like I didn't tell them what I overheard, but I know what's happening, and it's not good for the town. And you know, if you don't stop doing what you're doing, people are going to eventually find out and not vote for you again. Well, they took that as a threat. Mm. They didn't take kindly to it, and uh, they wouldn't change. So I, eventually I was left in a position where I had no choice but to go to the FBI. Wow. Huh. It's, and, and you write in there that it's small town politics, but it's the same way everywhere. Pretty much everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you, you see the same thing is going on in Congress today. Um, yeah. People are left behind, are left out well, if they don't go you, with the program. put this in there, I'll vote for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It's all bargaining. And yeah. Stuff they, they, yep. crap that's thrown in there is just garbage. Yeah, they, they do it with things Pork. like the budget, too, right? Yeah. So remember the bridge to nowhere? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But it was required to get the support of that contingent. There was so one they, in Alaska where yes. they built, they sent them a ton of money, and a guy said, I said, if we could build it, would it be a good idea? But we can't. Yeah. <laughs> So they gave millions yeah. and millions of dollars. Yeah, yeah that's but irrelevant that's, whether or not it's a good thing. It's yeah, just it's, oh, let me do for this for my, my people yeah. and get the money. Maybe yeah. they'll give me some back. I think it's, it's sad that we put a politician in there and he is gung-ho, honest for a little while. And then he's taking money just like everybody else is. Yeah. And they come out rich. Yeah. And oh, you wonder <laughs> How yeah. can that be? We, we saw that with the Clintons. They, they went into the White House relatively poor. Yeah. And uh, they came out worth $150 million. How yeah. does that happen? Barack Obama. <laughs> yeah, that's uh -huh. one way. Um, not, yeah. not Harry Truman, though. <laughs> no, no. He went in poor, came out poor. <laughs> yeah. Even drove himself home. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now, it's, it's very sad culture that we can't get anything done. It's just... You, you just sit there. Now, how hard is it to get a hospital plan for everybody yeah, instead you, of arguing over it back and forth? Right. And you, you think it'd be relatively easy because we all know what it means to have it. Yeah. We've all been sick. And, and we got Medicare. Right. That works very well. Yeah. Why don't you use that? You use it, yeah. But no, we, we can't argue over using the same thing. So. Yeah. No, it's got to be something new or it doesn't yeah. generate new votes. And it all comes down so to the vote. you did this for a year, you wired? How did they get you to do it? Wire. Well, you know, the, um, the first meeting I had with the FBI uh, was at a Panera Bread in uh, Cranston, Rhode Island. Did they buy? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, I found out the FBI doesn't really spend much money on, on, on frivolity. Um, but they, uh, he listened to me, and I told him, you know, what I had. And he said, let me take it to my supervisors and I'll get back to you. Can we meet in a few more days? And I said, sure. So, uh, and I got to tell you, that meeting, I, I walked into Panera's, my, my legs were shaking. Bet. Oh, it was, a, it was the most terrific experience in my 17 years. Well, at the time, it wasn't quite 17 years in, in public office. Uh. <clears throat> and, um, you know, he uh, called me back and he said, my supervisors said that, um, that we, we can pursue this. Um, but the only way to do it is you have to wear a wire. Uh -huh. And I said, geez, uh, you know, isn't there any other way? I mean, uh, can't you tap their phones or, or do things like that? Why do you need me to wear a wire? He said, no, it's the only way. So um, I thought about it for a very short time, uh, discussed it with my wife, and then uh, we decided to go forward. So um, we, uh, we wore the wire, I wore the wire for, for 17 months wow. from uh, January of uh, 2009 through May of 2010, when the first arrest occurred. And um, I, for, for the 17 months, I had to tape record every phone call or personal encounter I had with three different councilmen. Uh -huh. Now, when you're on the council, you're talking to the, you know, your colleagues pretty much every day, right. several times a day. And there were three of them, so there were a lot of conversations. And I worked in the State House. I was Deputy Secretary of State at the time for Rhode Island. I worked with, uh, in the same building as one of the councilmen that was involved in this. He worked for the Senate. Yeah. So, um, 
you know, we were bumping into each other by accident in the hallway several times a day, and each time I had to put the recorder on. But it wasn't just a matter of turning on a tape recorder. There was a whole series of things that the FBI made, you do, made me do, and I, I assume makes everybody do that's in that situation. So, for example, <clears throat> if I got a phone call, and it was from one of the three councilmen, I had to let it go into voicemail, call the FBI, and say, I just got a phone call from Councilman X. And um, he would say, okay, put the recorder on. I would do that, had to recite a preamble. This is Paul Carancy. It's Thursday, October 28th, whatever the date is. Uh, it's 4 o'clock. I just got a call from Councilman X, and I'm going to return the phone call. And then I would call him back. Sometimes, frequently, my call would go into his voicemail. So now I'd have to call the FBI back and say, well, all this, the, the record is still running. Yeah. Call the FBI back and say, went into voicemail, what do you want me to do? Sometimes shut the recorder off, sometimes let it run for five minutes, see if he calls you back. Mm. If he called me back, I'd pick it up and the call would be recorded. Then I would have to recite a postamble. This is Paul Caranti, it's now this time, got a return phone call from a councilman and I'm shutting the recorder off. And then I would have to call the FBI back and recount the story, what, what happened during the phone call. Then, later that day, have to meet with the FBI, give them the recorder so we could take it and download the information onto their computers, then meet with them a second time, either the next morning or later that night, so we could return the recorder to me, now empty, um, and then start over. Oh, yeah. That's one phone call. Ah. This went on for 17 months, <coughs> and Tom, there were hundreds of phone calls. In fact, in all, there were 14. Teen, over over fourteen hundred hours worth of audio and video recordings that were made. Oh my God! Yeah, it was a, an extraordinary intrusion in my life. <laughs> and a funny story: one night I was out to dinner with my wife and two good friends, their wives, the six of us, and um, we hadn't been out to dinner in a long time with this group, so we were looking forward to it. And we sat down, ordered our food, and no sooner did we finish ordering, my phone rings. It's one of the councilmen. So now I have to excuse myself. Yeah. I have to go record the preamble, do all of what I just described. Well, before the call came back and I was able to record it and get back to the FBI, something like 40 minutes passed. Now you go walking back into the restaurant, everybody's pretty much done eating. Yeah. And it's like, where have you been? What happened? Mm -hmm. And I can't tell anybody where I've been. <laughs> So you try explaining that to the group you're sitting with. At a yeah. Can I eat my, can I eat my food? <laughs> <laughs> wow. It was, it was a, an interesting time in my life, to wow. say the least. Yeah, you probably on pins and needles. Yeah, it was, there were times when it was scary. Over your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there were times when I had to meet in person rather than a phone call. And um, when I, whenever we'd meet in person, um, there was a video recording involved. So the FBI would you know, cut one of the buttons off my shirt and run a wire, they would cut a little hole in my pant pocket, and the recording device was in my, my pocket, and then the wire would run up under my, my pants and my shirt, and the button was a TV recorder, TV little, little monitor. Yeah. And I would have to make sure I'm facing them so I could uh, <laughs> you know, record their face and everything. Um, so it was, it was interesting, and I was certain that at that point I was going to get caught, because now if they pat you down, you're yeah. going to feel the wires. What is this? <laughs> Got yeah. a little ivory sticking up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let me dig it out for you. <laughs> yeah, with, with a knife, yeah. Wow. That's just, uh, and it, it must, have, must have made you nuts. Because you're yeah. trying to do a good job, and now you get to help these guys that are not doing a good job. Well, yeah. they're doing a good job but for themselves. For themselves, yeah. And I had to uh, insert myself into the conspiracy. I had to I call them you know, all under the supervision of the FBI, and tell them that I heard what you said in Florida, and why do you exclude me? Let me be part of this. Let me work with you. And there were three of them. I was the fourth, which means we now had a majority, four votes out of seven. So we, everything would be passed the way we wanted it to be passed. So mm. I was able to convince them. They let me into the conspiracy, and that's how I was able to get all the information. Huh. But I had to do that under FBI supervision, because if I... If I went out and on my own, inserted myself in the, into the conspiracy, I was now breaking the law. Ah, so yes. so I had to do it with their supervision yeah. and permission. Now, I was reading one article where the guy wanted to put an ob 
a restaurant or something in the middle of a parking lot. Yes. So he was willing to pay a ton for it, and the other guy for, said... For the liquor license. Yeah, the dime a dozen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. They, they, they weren't worth anything, but the people applying didn't know that. Didn't know so that. they were willing to pay five, ten thousand dollars $10,000 for a liquor license. Yeah, yeah it was, uh, it's awful. And you know how many legitimate businesses left and or never located there in the first place because we have a reputation for being so corrupt. Really? You know, um, Rhode Island in itself it has a reputation for corruption. Yeah. But federal judge Mary Lisi, who handled these cases, said at one point during the trial, or I think during the arraignment process, that they were presiding over a criminal conspiracy that made North Providence the most corrupt town in the country. Now, mm -hmm. the most corrupt town in a state that is considered the most corrupt state, do you know how bad that reputation is? <laughs> um, it didn't help us at all. You had CNC. He was the neighboring uh, city of Providence, that's right. And that, you know, those things were even worse, if that's possible. Not as many people Jeez. went to jail in the CNC case, but um, you know, the word is that he controlled everything that went on. You, know, you couldn't get on the police or fire department without paying a significant amount of money. Wow. And the way they did it was you buy uh, tickets to a fundraiser, so it all seemed legitimate. Oh, yeah. But you know, you're buying you know, 100 tickets to a $50 a person fundraiser. Oh. That's a lot of tickets, yeah. and nobody's showing up at the event. <laughs> wow. Good old buddy. I, I never knew the guy or anything. I just liked him. I thought he was a... Most people did, Yeah, Tom. Yeah, he was very charismatic. He was a you know, fun guy to be around. He's tremendous from Providence. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, he did. The guy was a visionary. Yeah. But he was just corrupt to go along <laughs> with it, and, you know, that's unfortunate. And white Peter. <laughs> yeah, and white well, he actually, he didn't beat his wife. He actually tortured the man who was uh, alleged to have had an affair with his ex-wife. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Uh, him and his, Buddy and his wife split up, divorced, um, and one of his good friends was having, uh, alleged to have had an affair, and he kidnapped that friend, Galeo was his name, kidnapped him, took him to his apartment where he had his uh, police you know, his dr the driver of his car was a police officer. He was forced to stand there while Buddy Sancy tortured him. Hit him with uh, logs from the fireplace, with uh, lit cigarettes. Um, yeah, and then threatened to kill him. Took a gun and threatened to kill him, but didn't let him go, and, and the rest was history. Jeez. Then he goes to jail and comes back and becomes mayor again. Again, yeah. Then he goes, well, the first time he resigned, um, didn't go to jail, he just stepped down and uh, paid a fine, I think, did some uh, community service or restitution. And then he became mayor again. Then he resigned a second time, went to jail, came back and ran for mayor again, yeah. and carried, Providence has 13 wards. He carried 12 of them. Wow. But he lost in one of the wards by a greater margin than he had won all the other wards by yeah. combined. So he ended up losing by 4,000 votes. But he almost became mayor a third time after a stint uh. in jail. But is that any worse than Mayor Curley in Boston, who got elected alderman uh, from his jail cell? Oh, is that right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> he got elected from his jail cell. Ah. Or um, in Massachusetts, three consecutive speakers of the House went to jail. In Illinois, four of the last seven governors went to jail. Wow. I mean, it's all over. Right, right here in Connecticut, Governor Rowland. Rowland went to jail, right? Yeah. It's, it's Twice. all over. <laughs> Twice. That's right. Yeah, he jail. got out and went back, yeah. And then he had a couple of mayors. One was something with his girlfriend's daughters. Uh, and then the other one just got out, of, got out of jail. He wants to run for governor. And they're saying, I don't think so. No. <laughs> <laughs> now it's amazing. The, the corruption's all around, and it's very prevalent. Uh -huh. And it gives all the good public servants a bad name. It does. Yeah. And, you know, I can remember as a kid, 15, 20 years old, and the good old boys, which wasn't bad, but it wasn't right. But if you knew the uh, mayor or a selectman or whatever it was, and if you had a snowplow, you had work all year yeah. long. Yeah, that's right. And while it was the good old boys, it really wasn't fair. <laughs> but we got the job done for yes. next to nothing. Right. And then they changed it all. Now it's $20, $25 an hour to plow that yeah. thing. <laughs> and they got to have a card, and they got to be in the union. Yeah. and so yeah, It's very different. Yeah. But the, the one constant seems to be the corruption, and it's unfortunate. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the book Wired is, um, 
it, it recounts my story clearly, um, and it talks about all the other corruption that wasn't even attached mm -hmm. to mine from North Providence. I got a police chief went to jail in a totally separate incident. Um, uh -huh. A state senator went to jail in a wholly separate incident. So, um, you know, the town <coughs> was corrupt, but I recount all that in the book, but it's also more than just a, a tale of corruption. It's a primer, to my mind, on how to be a good public servant. What you need to do to get the job done and, mm -hmm. and serve the people you're elected to serve rather than being self-serving. Um, I mentioned to you earlier, I had uh, two books that I did on political corruption. The first one, Scoundrels, uh, defines corruption. And it defines corruption and breaks it down to three categories, traditional, situational, and circumstantial political corruption. And each has both an active and a passive component, much like sin. Um, you know, if you know that your colleague's corrupt and you do nothing, well, that's a passive acquiescence okay. to the corruption. Yeah. So you're guilty of at least passive corruption, even if you're not taking a bribe yourself. Um, so I break it down and I give examples of each of the types of corruption using actual cases from Rhode Island. That's the first book. This was supposed to be one book, but my publisher said, you know, it, it's too much. People aren't going to read 700 pages. So break it down into two books. So the first book defines it, this and the second <laughs> book, yeah, this is a lot in itself, right, 450 pages. But it gives uh, vivid examples of each of the types of corruption that I talk about in the first book. Yeah. This book, you, you go through a lot of people and mentioning people that, that have gotten into trouble and, and uh, got a fly going around. Yeah. And uh, it's very interesting because you do uh, talk about uh, what each one of them has done and, and how you get involved in, in, into, I forget the guy's name now, with, uh, I don't remember when you Yeah, there's so many names. Yeah, that, yeah. You know. And I thought that was interesting. You've picked out a lot of people in that book. Yeah, and, and all of them were involved to some degree or another in corruption. Yeah. Which is sad. You know, sometimes we don't view corruption as corruption, and that's one of the problems. Um, sometimes people will say, well, that's just politics. But no, it's not. Politics is... Uh, the process of working together to get a job done that serves the people that you represent and serves them in a good way, not in a bad way. So, you know, if you, if you know you're allowing the construction of a building that's going to um, devastate traffic flow on a particular street and, and destroy the neighborhood because of the traffic situation, you don't want to do that. Yeah. You know, what the next happens... The question is, how much you're going to pay me? Well, that's <laughs> it. What happens politically is we don't want to do it unless it's lucrative enough. Yeah. Then, hell with the town. Yeah. Let's worry about how much we're going to be able to make off it. And that's where the corruption part comes in. But the act of voting for or against something that's good or bad for the town isn't corrupt in and of itself. So if you're not getting a bribe, if you're not getting a kickback, but it's not good for the town, then isn't that still corruption? Well, the yeah. law would say no, but yeah. yes, it is. So what I contend in, in the first book, Scoundrels, is corruption shouldn't necessarily be defined by whether or not you're violating a particular law. It should be defined based on um, the effect of the policy on society. If it's a negative effect, it should be considered corrupt, even if it doesn't break a law. Good example of that, um, if uh, a zoning board is considering um, a petition you bring before it <coughs> to, let's say you want to build an addition to your house. And you, you have enough land, but you need a variance from the zoning ordinance. So you apply to the zoning board for a variance, and you go before them. And by all reasonable standard of law, they have to give you the variance. But the next door neighbor happens to be the council president. And he calls the zoning board chairman and says, I don't want an addition built behind me because it's going to, you know, give me less land or less open space, so yeah. deny it. But we don't have a basis to deny it. Just deny it. Let them appeal it and go to court if they want to. And they deny it. Huh. That's not illegal, but it's corrupt. Yeah. And the case I describe in Scoundrels, it cost the petitioner $7,000 to appeal to Superior Court. The petitioner lost the buyer for the property 
during the two years that that appeal was going on, and he ended up selling the property at $30,000 less than he had the purchase and sales agreement for initially. So he lost $37,000. Yeah. He eventually got to sell the property and build the house for $37,000 less. So it wasn't illegal, but boy, that person took a beating yeah. at the hands of what I would consider corrupt, a corrupt act. That's a favor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it should be illegal, but yeah. it's not. There was a guy in that uh, had a, needed a variance, and the next door neighbor said, yeah, okay, go ahead, because next to his property or something, rather. And then a couple of years later, he got, got the neighbor ticked off at him. So they reported him that the property shouldn't have been there. <laughs> and uh, he had to move the, move the really? thing that he had. Oh. And I thought, you know, <laughs> these are friends. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We got about five minutes to go. Anything else you'd like to talk about? You got plenty of other books too. Oh yeah, I, this is um, my seventh, sixth, and seventh book. I, I just published uh -huh. my eighth. The eighth book is called *The Promise of Fatima: A Hundred Years of History, Mystery, and Faith*, and it's about the uh, apparitions in Fatima, Portugal, of Our Lady of Fatima to the three shepherd children, and it's a, pers um, a retrospective on what that message of a hundred years ago means in today's society. Um, it's been a good seller, and it's a good uh, good time for that because our world needs that message more than ever today. Yes, you know, if you look around, there's been so many miracles that people just say, "Oh, isn't that funny? That was a coincidence." Yeah, and you, you no, know, it's you a know miracle, it wasn't. right? And uh, now, tell me something about the uh, program that you belong to, the Rhode Island the Association of Rhode Island Authors. Yes, yeah, um, that is one of the largest. Um, book-related organizations in New England. We, ha we now have 315 members. Really? It, it grows constantly. Um, we have a signature event, a large fundraiser. It's uh, called the uh, Association of Rhode Island Authors Book Expo. That is happening on um, the 2nd of December at Rhodes on the Patuxet in Cranston, Rhode Island. And um, from 10 o'clock to 5 o'clock, we have 135 authors that uh, set up a table and sell and autograph their books. Uh, we have um, a series of panel discussions and individual presentations that go on throughout the day. There's uh, 10 of them in all. Mm. Um, they range uh, on subjects from um, how to publish a book uh, to how to write a book. There's workshops. We have uh, an area where uh, authors that are selling their books will be able to, um, they have five minutes each to talk about their own books and mm -hmm. uh, you know, promote them a little bit. Um, we have Marie Force, who's a, a national uh, award-winning author. She's a New York Times bestseller, a USA Today bestseller. She's our keynote speaker. Um, she writes um, uh, romance type uh, books. She uh, was signed by Harlequin. Um, but also self-publishes and small press publishes. And um, I think she's written about 100 books mm. starting in 2005 to, uh, to today. Um, and she's going to talk about her writing journey. Wow. So it's, a, it's an amazing event. It's free to the public. There's plenty of parking at the roads and uh, encourage anybody to come down and, and take a look. If you, if you have a flyer on that, send it to me back in... I will. Was that Saturday? It's a Saturday, yes, from 10 to 5. Well, I'll tell you what... They, the half hour goes by real quick. It, it does indeed. Uh, author Eileen Kaplan passed away recently, and she was a guest on my show four years ago. Eileen wrote, Laughter is the Breast Medicine, and she had lost a breast due to cancer. And she had a mastectomy, and then she wrote the book. And because it's, it's a lot of comical stuff in there, because she felt that anything that serious needs a little bit of comedy to live with it. Uh, I have the program here that uh, I'm going to have uh, SEC put it up on uh, YouTube next week so that you can re revisit Eileen and it's a tremendous lady. Uh, next, next week, Chris Kringle or St. Nick, whatever you have, will be visiting here as he is touring the areas before Christmas. And uh, of course, Santa Claus doesn't show up until Christmas. But this will be uh, St. Nick. Tune in to see what he does before Christmas. He goes around checking people out and spying on them, I believe. <laughs> Speaking of Christmas, 
I've had some great authors on this show, including Paul, and uh, we've got some great books. Email me, I'll send you a list of all the authors and the, and the uh, books that, that are available, and uh, perhaps you can buy some Christmas presents for different people. Now's the time to do it. Uh, check YouTube for past shows, Books and Things with Tom. And also check my Facebook page, Books and Things with Tom, for updates. And special thanks to Frank and Frank at the SEC for putting on the show for me and helping it out. I want to thank you for watching. Uh, check, make sure nobody's wearing a wire if you're doing something wrong. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> or better yet, don't do anything wrong. <laughs> <laughs> better yet, don't do anything wrong, you're right. Uh, you should be reading Cuddle Up with a Good Book, and it's going to be getting cold night soon. It is. And I'll uh, see you next time. Thanks for watching. Thank you so much, Tom.